as we've established, Dori Halmerson. Um, I am a Presbyterian mission coworker in Honduras, which is, um, I should have brought up my map. I was just scrambling looking for it as you were introducing me, but um, Honduras is um, in Central America. It is south of Guatemala and north of Nicaragua. It's um, one of the larger countries uh, in Central America, and it has a long Caribbean coastline. It has a small Pacific coastline, so it straddles the, the isthmus that connects North and South America. And um, there are about 9 million people uh, in Honduras, um, most of whom are rural um, rural people. There are two, two cities of, that total about 3 million people total, uh, one on the northern coast and one in the central highlands, which is where I am. I live in Tegucigalpa, which is a city of about 1.2 million people. And I serve uh, the Presbyterian Church of Honduras, which is um, a small, rather young denomination of people. Um, they are 28 congregations of about 100 people each on average. Uh, three of the congregations are in Tegucigalpa and the rest are uh, rural, rather remote uh, congregations. So I do a lot of traveling and four wheel driving and that sort of thing to mountain, mountain communities. Um, and I facilitate theological education and leadership development with the Presbyterian Church of Honduras. So I teach, I um, work with two Honduran co-workers, and so we work to manage a program of um, a bit, sort of like a seminary. There is no seminary in Honduras. Uh, most of our pastors have a high school education at best. Um, all of our pastors have a high school education at best, um, and some have less than a high school education. And so um, we're really hungry for pastoral preparation and um, collaboration and learning from each other um, in the Presbyterian Church. So um, there is no seminary, there's no formal university seminary, and with a high school education, we wouldn't be qualified to enter a seminary even if it existed. So um, we have to be kind of creative. Um, the curriculum that we use is from uh, a Costa Rican seminary that's also a PCUSA partner. And um, it's a seminary-like curriculum with all the same topics that I or your pastors um, studied in seminary and graduate school. Uh, but on in a in a mode that is a, a communal education model, so that it's very accessible to people without a formal education. And so uh, we teach biblical studies, and we teach pastoral care, and we teach preaching. We're just wrapping up um, this week our, our class on preaching. So we have about twelve students in an online class. We we're in person until the pandemic hit. And then we um, had a hiatus for about a year and we took our classes online via Zoom. And I was very skeptical um, that that would work, uh, but it has worked really well. So we've been able to include students that we weren't able to include in person um, and, and keep the curriculum going. So as we go forward, um, even with the challenges of access to technology and access to internet and access to bandwidth for Zoom calls, um, we're going to still maintain some sort of hybrid, uh, hybrid in-person and online model. So, so the pandemic has changed us uh, for the better in many ways. And so that's sort of what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, some of the challenges that we've had as um, as Presbyterians in Honduras. I stayed in Honduras for the duration of the pandemic. Um, I um, didn't see my family for about 18 months. My family lives in, in Utah, in the Western United States. And, um, and yeah, I've sort of witnessed the transformation that, that's been happening in in the Honduran church since then. So that's that's mainly what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Um, 
so what I'm what I'm planning to do is um, give a talk of about 20 minutes or so, and then um, and then open it to um, open the conversation a bit to uh, more of a more of a conversation. Um, I want to share some material that the Honduran church has used and that I've worked on translating to English um, as we've gone through the, the pandemic and uh, natural disasters that have happened over the past two years here in Honduras. Um, the church has been working to transform its vision of what mission is and what its relationship to its community is. And so I want to share a little bit about of that process with you and um, uh, and we'll we'll get a taste of the kind of um, teaching that I that I do in my work here. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to open up with um, uh, prayer and a scripture reading, and then I will jump in. So let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for bringing us together across time and space uh, to meet together, to study your word, to see what you are doing in the world so that we may participate in it. Help us to hear with your ears, see with your eyes, and love with your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, the scripture I want to open with um, was chosen um, by a group of um, Honduran volunteers in mission. Um, and so I will read from Mark chapter four, verse one, starting with verse one. It's known as the parable of the soils. Jesus began to teach beside the lake again. Such a large crowd gathered that he climbed into a boat there on the lake. He sat in the boat while the whole crowd was nearby on the shore. He said many things to them in parables. While teaching them, he said, listen to this, a farmer went out to scatter seed. As the farmer was scattering seed, some fell on the path and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow. They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked the seeds and they produced nothing. Other seed fell into good soil and bore fruit. Upon growing and increasing, the seed produced in one case a yield of 30 to 1, in another case a yield of 60 to 1, and in another case a yield of 100 to 1. Jesus said, whoever has ears to listen should pay attention. So I love this parable because it's... Uh, it's a parable of a very bad sower. We call it the parable of the good sower, but it, anyone who knows anything about gardening, and I know a very limited amount about gardening, knows that the sower is not very good. I've watched some farmers or gardeners, like my dad and his backyard vegetable garden, and like subsistence farmers in Honduras with crops of corn and beans, and they do not sow like this, scattering the seeds over all kinds of ground. This would be stupid. They would lose three quarters of their crop without, from the outset, 
from to the weeds to the scorching sun. The uh, farmers and gardeners that I know are very um, careful. They um, they count out the seeds. They put them in the right kind of soil. They adjust the soil. They plant at the right time of year. They make a hole the right size. They gently cover the seeds. They pour on the right amount of water. They watch the seeds. They chase away birds and rodents. They wait, they wait, they wait. They irrigate if they need to. They put up shade structures if they need to. They tie the plants to stakes. They pull out the weeds. And when the plants start growing and sprouting, their work is still not finished. My Dad joked last summer as his butternut squash was sprouting that he would have to choose one plant out of each cluster of three or four and murder most of the baby plants so that the ones that were left could survive and give fruit. And so this is not the sower that we see in this parable. The sower sows indiscriminately showering the ground with all kinds of seed, showering all kinds of grounds with the seed and doesn't seem to care whether they'll lose three quarters of their crop before it sprouts. So like I said, this parable was chosen by a group of Hondurans um, almost exactly a little over one year ago. Um, I was in the middle of helping my Honduran church colleagues respond to communities that had been affected by the hurricanes Eta and Iota, which struck Honduras within one week of each other in November of 2020. And as these hurricanes were still raging, and the Presbyterian churches of Honduras were thanking God that they and their communities had been spared severe damage, I received a phone call from my friend and colleague, Alex Rodas. And Alex wanted to act. He was desperate to act. We were watching people be rescued in rowboats from the tops of their houses on TV. We were watching mudslides sweep away entire families. And we didn't know it at the time, but some communities would be cut off from hospitals and supplies, and some homes would be unlivable and filled with toxic mud for weeks, for months even. And Alex said, I have to do something. Now, I, I'm a pastor. I'm not a first responder. I'm not uh, a farmer. I'm not a rescuer. The church itself has few financial resources. We have no experience mounting a mission and service effort on its own. The Honduran church has always been the recipient of mission, uh, the needy side of a relationship between U.S. and Honduran partners. And we were nine months into the COVID-19 pandemic. So many of our members had lost jobs and lost loved ones, and our churches were struggling to stay afloat on their own. We were thanking God that our churches had not been affected by the hurricane. So when Alex told me that he thought we should act in the face of this natural disaster, I was skeptical. I admit. What good would we do? Do we even know where to start? And I told Alex, I think we have to pray and trust that our prayers would be enough. I wanted Alex to send his thoughts and prayers to those who were stranded on their rooftops. Well, that was not good enough for Alex or for the 40 Presbyterian volunteers he gathered to visit a mountainside community three weeks after the hurricanes had struck. These 40 volunteers included nurses, a psychologist, a pharmacist, pastors, teachers, many of whom had been educated with Presbyterian scholarships and who had spent their youth accompanying U.S. groups doing construction work or mounting medical clinics in their Presbyterian communities. And so they chose to work in a community that had no Presbyterian church, and this decision was not universally accepted at first. I'm sure that in Derry, and I know I have heard similar doubting questions in my own conversations about mission and the church's role in our communities. 
Shouldn't the church be doing evangelism in those communities? Shouldn't the church's first responsibility be to its own members' spiritual health? We have no money. How can we afford to spend what little we have on strangers far away when our communities have needs too? And again, my prophetic friend Alex was not swayed by these questions. His heart was broken with compassion for the people he saw suffering and also for his church's own volunteers and young people. Alex had been accompanying mission workers for years, more than a decade really, helping US Presbyterians connect with Honduran Presbyterians and experience transformation in the act of volunteering, serving neighbors, constructing homes as members of Carlisle Presbytery have done, installing solar panels and water purification systems, putting on rural medical clinics. Alex had seen the transformation that had taken place over a decade of partnership between US and Honduran youth, mutual transformation on both sides of the language and culture barrier. It recently occurred to me that Alex was so insistent that we help hurricane survivors, not only because they needed help, but because we needed the transformation that comes with Christian service. The leap of faith we would need to take in order to decide who is our neighbor and how God calls the church to be in relationship with its neighbors. So by the end of 2021, the Honduran Presbyterian Church had put on medical clinics, including psychological workshops and food distributions in four different communities, four communities affected by hurricanes Eta and Iota. Between the hurricane relief effort and COVID-19, the church had given away 10,000 bags of weekly food supplies and treated around a thousand patients. And in the middle of this work, we began reflecting on the parable of the good sower. And most of my interpretation of this text comes from those weeks of reflection with our Honduran hurricane volunteers. So who is God in this parable? Well, God is the sower, of course. But this wasn't our first answer. We thought maybe humans were the sower or Christians. But when we looked carefully at the sower, we realized that this sower is not acting in a human way, covering, conserving the seed, carefully choosing the ground. This sower is acting in a wholly other way, like a godlike way, indiscriminately scattering seed, graciously scattering seed abundantly scattering seed over all the fields, hillsides, and roads. So who are the humans in this parable? We thought maybe we were the seeds being scattered like Christian missionaries to serve the rocky, thorny soil, sometimes being attacked by satanic birds, sometimes being choked by sin and greed, being burned up by the scorching sun. But no, actually, we concluded that we are the soil. We are the soil that is receiving the seed, abundantly, the abundantly given and free grace of God. And how do we know what kind of soil we are? By the fruit we produce in the end. How can we become good soil to produce fruit? That's the question. How does bad soil become good in the real world outside parabolic folk tales? Well, the farmer changes it. The farmer adds fertilizer, directs water, removes stones and weeds, protects the soil from invaders. It is hard, backbreaking work. I have seen Honduran farmers sow corn and sorghum on the literal sides of cliffs, walking up 50 degree hillsides to plow, haul water, and carry harvests on their own backs. 
imagine that God is putting that work into you and to me to transform us, to cultivate us, and to grow us into fertile ground for the seeds of grace. Alex knew that his Presbyterian siblings needed this kind of transformation that only comes from seeing Christ in the suffering face of one's neighbor. Alex knew that I and other U.S. friends of Honduras needed to see our Presbyterian siblings in an empowered place, enacting their call to serve their neighbors, hearing the call to mission and responding. I personally have been transformed over the past year by reading this reading of a familiar parable. And the Honduran Presbyterian Church has been slowly transformed as well. In November of this year, some of the volunteers in the hurricane response completed a pilot project of working with the same communities to supply uh, farming implements, and um, supplies to plant crops that had been lost in the hurricanes. And they formed and proposed to the Honduran Presbytery a mission organization that will plan and direct the social action of the church, making an effort to redefine what the church's relationship with the larger community will be. A subgroup of this uh, larger body is working to form a Presbyterian health program. Professionals, young professionals, newly graduated doctors and nurses uh, looking at their community's health and saying that God cares about that and the church should be working for communal health. These volunteers have come to believe that God is calling them to bear fruit and to see the world and not only their churches as the recipients of God's abundant grace and love. Part of our reading and interpretation of this, uh, of this parable has come from a study called Church and Community and Mission, Church Community and Mission that was produced by one of our uh, Costa Rican partners, the Latin American Biblical University, um, on the theology of mission, on why we do God mission, God's mission, what is the church's mission in the world. Um, and um, earlier this year, uh, we translated this study to English and have begun offering it to um, U.S. partners and different presbyteries and churches as a study. And so I um, wanted to uh, offer you a taste of that over the next uh, few minutes, half hour or so, uh, um, the introduction to that study. So um, I want to pause and um, ask if there are any questions or if anyone has any uh, anything they'd like to say uh, in response to what I've said so far, or any questions, personal questions for me too. Story? Yes. Um, I'm Lois Harris. Hi, Lois. I, I could do it in my home. Yes. <laughs> Great for me. Um, and I remember that you spoke of fulfilling in your own mind not with a purpose, but a dream or a thought that your aunt had also served in Central or South America. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm remembering that correctly. I'm wondering if you are working with her spirit or have you been also thinking of fulfilling a family tradition or how that has played out in your life? Because you spoke of it several times when we chatted before and I wonder if that is still alive within you. I'm carrying on a legacy that I didn't realize God had in mind for me. And yet here I took is there is that still alive in you or sure yes I, I serve not only with my aunt's spirit but with her body. She is still a mission co-worker um, and she works in Guatemala. 
And so I, I work with her. I'm, I'm a team member of hers now. Um, she's, she's a few years from a couple years from retirement probably. Um, but when I was young, she was a mission coworker serving in El Salvador. And my first taste of Central America was through her. My family visited her uh, in 1993, um, just before they, her, she and her family moved back to the United States um, to change, change career paths. But she's now back in mission service and is serving as regional liaison for, um, for Guatemala and Mexico. So she, she works with partners in both those countries and on the US-Mexico border. And so we're colleagues. Um, her father, my grandfather was also in mission service. So he, he served in the 1950s and 60s uh, with the National Board of Missions with the Northern US, the Northern Presbyterian Church uh, at that time in um, Ganado, Arizona uh, in a reservation church. Um, as a mission pastor. And so, yeah, that's where I'm now the third generation of not only pastors, but mission pastors in my family. And so that um, is not something that I have always thought that would be a tradition for me. Um, I started my professional life as a journalist. So I studied journalism in undergrad and um, worked for nine years as a newspaper journalist. Um, uh, before switching career paths to, I like to joke to a, a customer base that's older and faster dying than newspaper readers, which is the Presbyterian church. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and so, yeah, I experienced that kind of sense of call, um, to mission service later, you know, a little later in, in my life. Um, but um, yeah, so that generational um, dynamic is certainly still playing out for me. Before you left, we, we prayed with you and we were very concerned and we did not want to heighten your concern, but there was the concern of you and your safety um, <clears throat> within that mission work. And yet you felt God wanted you there and you said God will provide safety for me and obviously you're still here yes what have you found have you found uh, that it has been easy for you as a woman and um, as somebody in the mission work there has there been a sense of peace or comfort or security or should we still continue to pray for that because we were very very worried about you because we cared for you um thank you for that and um yes safety is always a concern here in Honduras. Um, I would say not, uh, not to very, not to a much higher level than than I than I felt being a single woman in the United States. Um, I don't feel any more or less safe, really. And I take many of the same precautions. I don't go out at night alone. I try not to drive on out to rural air, remote areas alone. I try to always go accompanied. Um, and the church has been very conscious of my safety. And, um, and I feel completely perfect, protected and well advised by my church partners. So I don't, um, the, 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 you know, I ironically served as a journalist, so I know I know how sensational headlines can be. Uh, and and um, when I was moving here, the 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 big headline about Honduras was that that it was the murder capital of the world. It had that dubious distinction of having a very high right rate of violence, and there is a very high rate of violence against women, um, particularly. Um, and uh, gang related violence and, and delinquency. So um, it no longer holds that distinction. I think they passed that on to some other, some other Latin American country, but, um, but yeah, it is a concern. Um, I also enjoy a great amount of privilege. I could choose the neighborhood where I live. Um, 
and that was chosen with my safety in mind primarily um, so that I don't stand out too much. You know, I'm, I'm a single woman with a white face and blue eyes. And so I would stand out quite a lot in many neighborhoods here that could make me a target. And so we, we thought about that before I decided where to live. Um, and I enjoy a US salary and I don't have to take tra public transportation. That's, that's dangerous here. Um, I drive a car, that sort of thing. So I haven't been, I haven't been pickpocketed or mugged yet. That's, that's probably the largest risk. <laughs> um, I've been, uh, I've been robbed twice in my life and both times in the United States, my car was broken into and things were stolen out of it. So hasn't happened here yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to note that uh, I, through your presentation earlier that I so enjoyed, I am I'm noting a, a piece within you. So oh, you, you wouldn't, if you felt uh, uncomfortable, if you felt frantic or ill at ease. So I am noticing a, a piece within your demeanor and your speaking. So I'm thankful to God for that. So it's there and I see it. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I'm i glad to hear that. And I, I think I agree. Yeah, I, um, I feel, I feel at ease here. Um, it's a, it's a strange and weird life. Not a lot of people really understand the life of being a, a, an expat, you know, living, living in a, in a country that's not your own. That has a, some unique stresses and things that I have to manage. Um, and of course the pandemic, of course, created added on layers on top of that. Um, my dentist, I was grinding my teeth so hard that my dentist said I broke two teeth in my back of my mouth <laughs> when I was sleeping. So that stress like manifests in very physical ways. Um, and it's something that we all have, we have to manage, you know, it's just something that I have to be aware of and conscious of in my life and that I've taken steps to, um, to cope with. And I have a very good support system. Um, uh, members of Carlisle Presbytery are part of that support system through the Honduras Mission Network. Um, um, Kim Wadlington, particularly, who's a pastor in Carlisle and other members of the Presbytery are, are part of that kind of supportive network for me. So um, yeah, I'm very lucky in that regard to have good coping strategies and good a good support network. Can you speak uh, toward the uh, popularity of Christianity in the country and uh, maybe done, uh, what denominations are prevalent? Um, yeah, it's very popular. It's, it's uh, almost... Um, almost 100% Christian, I'd say in the, in the 90s, in the 90, 90 percentile. Um, probably about half of that population is Catholic and a half the population is some, some flavor of Protestant. Um, there's very, very little ecumenical crossover. There's a lot of suspicion and um, even kind of polemics issued against other denominations. So, um, more than anything between Catholics and Protestants and vice versa, um, but also between Protestant denominations. Um, Honduras is a very conservative, very socially conservative country. Um, kind of, uh, there's a fundamentalist and Pentecostal flavor to many Protestant denominations here. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the landscape the landscape of the church in Honduras. The, the Honduras Presbyterian Church that um, I serve was actually founded by lay people from Guatemala. Um, they were Presbyter the Presbyterian Church founded by US missionaries in Guatemala is very large and very powerful and very extensive. Um, and Presbyterian lay people who were from Guatemala coming to Honduras about 65, 70 years ago for work uh, in sawmills in the lumber industry, um, got to Honduras and found no Presbyterian church in the town where they landed. And so they founded a Presbyterian church. And that's 
that was sort of the, the beginnings of the denomination that I serve. There's another reformed denomination called the um, Christian Reformed Church of Honduras that um, is kind of geographically further north along the, the their main site is in San Pedro Sula, which is on the Caribbean coast, largest city on the Caribbean coast. And so, but there's very little interaction between the two denominations. There, there exists two, there are two, two reformed churches in Tegucigalpa. Um, I've never been to either of them, although I have contact with some of their clergy and leaders, but um, there just isn't any real in crossover between the two denominations. They know each other exists, but um, that's one of the harder things for me. I, I, I think, so I, I, in the US, I trained as, an, as a chaplain. So I worked in a medical, medical setting that was very interfaith and diverse. Um, you know, I was serving not only Presbyterians, but all kinds of people in, in those, and those kinds of settings. And so I, in my day-to-day -day work life, talked very little about being Presbyterian or, or what it meant to be Presbyterian. I mean, it was just very rare. There were people had other things on their minds when they're in the hospital, right? So, um, so that's a little strange. For, that's a little strange and difficult for me. It's one of my values is kind of religious diversity and um, and uh, ecumenism. But that that's not a uh, value here, especially that's especially important. Can you speak to the living standards of the typical countrymen? Um, are they like uh, really poor or uh, job wise? Is there plenty of jobs around that kind of thing? Right. Um, yeah, Honduras is. I mean, again, the the statistics and um, headlines are that um, Honduras is the second poorest country in Latin America after Haiti. Um, so the standard of living is very low. The unemployment and underemployment rate is very high. Um, and most people work in some form of the informal informal sector of work in, in uh, domestic service or in subsistence farming. Um, so yeah, very low standard of living, very low rates of running water. Some of our Presbyterian communities have just in the past five years gotten electricity in their communities um, and that's through solar panels. They're not connected to the grid. So um, yeah, cooking on fires is a very high uh, latrines rather than running water toilets is very high, very common uh, in rural areas. There's a big divide between rich and poor as well. Um, uh, and that, and so the and the unemployment and economic um, strains are um, have been thrown into re sharp relief and and made more problematic by the pandemic. Of course, um, we have a public public health system that was that is sort of near collapse at the best of times and. Um, has been really, really strained by the pandemic um, over the past two years, so. So there's a lack of middle class, I guess. Uh, you have the poor and then the ones that have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, that's a good sum up. Um, last, year, last year, the World Food Program, um, which is a UN, UN program, um, estimated that the, oh the rate of hunger and, and malnutrition in Honduras would double this year because primarily because of the pandemic and lack of jobs and an economic opportunity. And um, the, the largest portion of uh, migrants on the US-Mexico border uh, at this point are Honduran uh, waiting to enter the United States um, for looking for work. They're, that's, they're primarily economic opportunity migrants um, forced out of the country by lack of opportunity.
the country is also very corrupt. Um, there's a lot of lack of transparency and, um, and um, a lot of impunity at the higher levels of government. Um, just recently, the um, former president of Honduras was extradited to the US and is facing uh, federal narco trafficking charges in the United States in the Southern District of New York. And so he's awaiting trial. His brother was sentenced to life um, two years ago and, um, and is serving in prison in US prison. Um, and so that's kind of, um, it's a little jaw dropping to have a, an ex-president of a country extradited to the United States and, and facing charges in the United States about that. Um, that doesn't happen every day. So we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. I have a question regarding your, your story of the sower. Mm -hmm. What was the, the community, once you guys got together and decided to go out, how did that, how was that received both by the people who went out and the recipients in the community? How did it change the workers? How did it change the community? Um, in, I would say, um, the, so the communities were not Presbyterian church communities. They were, um, they, 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 there are churches in their communities, but they, they, they aren't Presbyterian. Um, we chose the communities based on um, having the, the first community that we visited, we chose because um, some of our Honduran Presbyterian church members had some connection and some knowledge of something that was happening in that, in that particular community. Um, and we went to, to, look at, to look at the community and to sort of assess what needs were there and then um, decided to offer this medical medical clinic service. And this happened about two weeks after the second hurricane hit. Um, so three weeks after the first hurricane hit. And um, the community itself, I would say, probably didn't experience that much like permanent transformation on our, just by our being there. We were really serving just an emergency response need. Um, we can, I can, show you some pictures. I accidentally closed my folder. So I was trying to look for the pictures that I was going to show during the sermon, but um, uh, if you give me just one second to reopen that, I can show you some of that. Ah, there it is. So, um, um, but the, the, some of the, so I, I mentioned the questions that we heard, you know, some of, some of the kind of old school pastors or le church leaders in our, in our Presbyterian community uh, wanted to, for example, set up like a, before, before going to see the community had had gotten it into their heads that they wanted to set up a loudspeaker and do sort of a tent revival type of effort in addition to the medical clinic and the food, um, which um, our, uh, I and our volunteers um, sort of railed against doing that. Uh, we, we, um, knew that some of there were there were homes that were completely washed away there were people injured there were about 12 people who had died instantly in the first mudslide what had happened in this community was that a a natural 
material natural materials that had been kind of washed washing down the mountainside uh, in this heavy, heavy hurricane rain, um, dammed up behind a, a, a little bridge over a creek. And that dam had burst and, and instead of flowing down the creek bed had flown, flowed down into the town basically and literally washed away uh, homes and entire families of people had to escape in the middle of the night, their homes. And so um, this is not the kind of community that needs a tent revival, right? They were traumatized, they were terror terrorized, terrified by this, um, this experience. And um, um, I think that the transformation, the, the, the deepest transformation that I saw was on was in the group of volunteers who were seeing this, this, this effect that the hurricanes had had in their communities. And so um, once you see that kind of suffering and pain, uh, it makes it a lot harder to, to You know, some of you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? People can't hear the gospel um, if they don't have food, or if they ha are in a medical emergency, or if they're if they don't have safety. And so, I think this transformation that is still taking place um, within this group of volunteers that banded together um, to 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 be a prophetic voice to the, so it, what emerged was a prophetic voice. Um, church, the church leaders, kind of the old school church leaders are hearing and paying attention to this group of young volunteers who, who have become um, kind of the, 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 the drum beaters of this um, prophetic evangelistic movement saying evangelism is not uh, just preaching with words evangelism is preaching with our actions and showing solidarity and justice in in communities that are that maybe don't even include our churches so um, that's the transformation that I've seen Um, I think you, I hope you can see my. Oh, there we can see it. Yeah, now we yes. see it. We got it. So there's a, this is um, in a rural community mm. where, we, where we were, there, there used to be a house here. So you can see these rocks have washed away the house and you can see the level of water wow. um, in the back. So this was a, this gentleman um, was speaking about, um, this is his home, it's completely washed away. All that's left is anything that was concrete and stuck down. Um, and you can see the machines working in the background. Um, he escaped out the window of his home with his wife and toddler. Um, they were clinging to a tree and he went back uh, into the home to get his infant child and unfortunately lost his infant child. Um, they were, the baby was washed away by the force of the water as he was trying to escape his home. And so that was what he was experiencing as we were, um, <coughs> as we were visiting. So um, this is a, a fellow Presbyterian volunteer. He's now the president or kind of head of the mission group that we formed called Buen Sembrador, which means good sower. Um, that's where we took the inspiration of the, the mission group of the church um, from this parable. Um, wow. 
this 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 road was closed. This road was completely washed and covered with mud for about two months. So this is about two and a half months after the opening after after the hurricanes that this road had been opened. This was the first time we were making our way into the community. So you see some of our food gathering efforts and packing efforts, some of those 10,000 bags of food. Um, this is about 2,500 bags of food that we're packing in this particular instance. And of course, medical personnel. So she's a Presbyterian church medical volunteer. She's a Presbyterian church medical volunteer. So is she. And she's a, she's a, this is actually Alex's sister, Ellie. She's a pharmacist and she, she's part of, and this is Alex's daughter, uh, Fernanda. So they're running the pharmacy of our little medical clinic. And so this is a, a group of people in, in Chongko, which is in uh, Mayan, mountainous Mayan region of Honduras that was, um, not the same community as the first ones you saw. It was not damaged as badly, but um, but was cut off from medical medical aid and from 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 the market, from food food assistance for a couple of months, and lost crops. And so Chunko was one of our um, pilot projects where we um, supplied um, Farming, farming supplies to replant harvests that, that had been lost due to the hurricanes. Um, and they were lost primarily because of access. So they couldn't get to the, their bean harvest before they started rotting on the vines because, because of the water and the rot, washed out roads and the infrastructure. So the, the beans themselves actually sprout, you know, were sprouting in the fields and then were unusable. Uh, by the time they could get get to harvest them because of the timing of the hurricanes, and the amount of water and how they were cut off. So it's very, it's very complicated. Not all of the emergencies were those immediate like natural disaster emergencies. And it's this and the supply chain all the way down. Um, you know, we've we spent a lot of time looking at supply chains in the last half of the pandemic, right? Uh, and with um, oil prices rising and all of that. And um, this is sort of a microcosm of that supply chain effort with one, with one domino, um, we can affect, a natural disaster can affect families for months and even years uh, by pushing down one domino. So. And I'm with you. I'm with you next week as well. And so I think, I think next week, um, maybe we'll dig in a little bit to the um, to the the study that I mentioned. So the study that we use to reflect theologically on our experience as these as emergency response volunteers um, to think about what is the church's mission in the world and what. Um, what is God calling, how is God calling us to interact with, with not only our own church members, but with the community at large, you know, who is our neighbor? What is the purpose of the church? What are the great ends of the church? That's kind of a Presbyterian phrase. Um, so uh, next week we will be um, in Dominican Republic, hopefully building houses there. Um, we need to hear that probably. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have another rebound. <laughs> Who's who is we? Where wh what wh who? No, you're not going this year. Oh, so there's a, a small contingent going, but we um, have been uh, if I'm repeating anything, we have gone to Dominican Republic for about twenty years, but well, actually seventeen. Seventeen. It's just seemed like twenty. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with the unrest down there and then the pandemic, we haven't been there for four years. But 
out having lost those friends that we've made there um, is, is painful. And did you go to visit through CEPA, through the Presbyterian partner there? So, um, went through an organization called Bridges to Community, which was started by Presbyterians um, that had visited, it's a long story, that had visited Nicaragua. Um, since then, it, the administration of that has mainly been given over to indigenous, you know, Nicaraguan people or, or um, Dominican Republic people. So we've had a long association with them even before they went to Nicaragua. Yeah, the, the Honduran church um, has uh, has had for years um, kind of annual visits from Carlisle Presbytery, from uh, Tampa Bay Presbytery, and from Arkansas Presbytery, and some various other organizations. And for now, two and well, three, this is the third year where we will not have had any U.S. volunteers visiting us. So we've had to, um, that's been part of the transformation of um, our Honduran church communities to, to think about how they will step up and fill the gap in some ways, but also um, take more direction about what they believe the church's mission is and should be, as well as how U.S. Presbyterians can participate and collaborate with them. So, yeah, it's been, it's, we're in the middle of the transformation still. When Mark Eglin Crager came and started the association with Honduras, we had already had a pretty long-term association with Nicaragua with the people down there. So our church in particular hasn't done much in Honduras. Mm -hmm certainly supports Mark. He came to Nicaragua one, only once, maybe? Once, yeah. But his mm -hmm. sons came a couple of times. Yes. Yeah. One of the mission things that we that they have done is they had a design of building uh, block houses that would withstand storms. And or and or, or and earthquakes. So they used rebar, put up a about a sixteen by twenty, something like sixteen by twenty, one story with a slanted roof that was anchored, a steel roof that was anchored, and then they would some would pour a concrete floor, some would just use a dirt floor, but put a good foundation in, tied all together with rebars so that. The, the houses when they were finished were not like the ones that you showed, but a, a very nice, sturdy building. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, over the years, we built what, about 30? Well, British community has over 500. Yeah, but I, mean, I don't know how many. We do a couple every year, yeah. two a year uh, that are sponsored by our church. But yeah, they have done a lot. And they started building houses. They were bridges to community when they first went there. Um, in the 90s, they really went as a community organization, building latrines and uh, yeah, other buildings. But then they had the hurricane in 2000, maybe, um, right, right. which wiped out all their houses. And they just started building houses and decided that that's the way to go. Yeah. You've got to provide shelter. Yeah. So interested to know if the houses that were wiped out are being rebuilt. Yeah, some of them, some of them were, um, some probably haven't been yet. Um, the, and the, the, the largest, well, the damage that you saw of the homes that were washed away was due to a flash flood, which was a little bit different. It, they weren't blown away by a hurricane. They were, um, they were kind of knocked away by rocks and, uh, but yeah, they were that wood, wood construction on a concrete foundation um in that in that case but then in in larger cities there were people in san pedro sula who were whose homes were filled with mud they were flooded they weren't necessarily by by both um seawater and river water so the amount of water that came in to some low-lying areas was just enormous and so they were um, literally filled with mud um, 
So it's taken it's taken a while. The San Pedro Sula airport was in about six feet of mud. I saw some like machines taken out of the airport, you know, like those um, luggage movers, you know, like that transport the luggage around. They're about six feet tall. Um, I saw some of them being transported on the highway and they were covered in mud up to the top. So they had been under water <laughs> at the airport. Well, thank you, Doria. Uh, this is scheduled to end at 10 o'clock, which is like a minute from now. And I don't know if it does it automatically or not. So uh, okay. thank you very much for your presentation. And we look forward to next week. Thanks. Yeah, I'll be back next week. And I, and I will send you some kind of pre-materials, I think, next week to get us better prepared and on the same page. So.